Welcome, welcome to Europe House. Um, thank you for being so numerous tonight. I mean, lots of things going on, but we appreciate it that, that you're all here. Um, my name is Susanne Oberhaus. I'm the head of the European Parliament uh, Liaison Office here in, in the UK. Um, we are very pleased uh, to co-host this evening's event. And I would first like to extend a very warm welcome to the Centre for European Research of Queen Mary's uh, University of London, and in particular, Sarah Wolf. Um, with whom we have uh, worked to set up this evening, um, and her team, obviously. Um, we would like to congratulate the CER to, on becoming a Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence. Uh, um, so, well, one of the main aims of the European Parliament Liaison Office here is to promote a healthy debate on EU-related topics, and we regularly hold events on uh, uh, political um, topics, um, issues relating to Brexit, obviously, uh, a wide range of subjects. I mean, just like 10 days ago, we had here uh, one of our annual events uh, <laughs> on the Sakharov Prize, which uh, is the European Parliament Prize to promote um, human rights and the freedom of, of thought. So, in this context, I would like to particularly underline that independently of the political developments, this office will continue its presence here in London and its operations. And uh, in that way, I would also like to invite um, you interested in teaming up uh, with us um, to, to, to contact us, to get in touch. Um, we certainly would look forward to working more closely with institutions such as Queen Mary's um, to, to work together next year and, and beyond. Um, because we, we also think that I mean, there is so much uh, ambient noise in social media and, and elsewhere that sometimes um, it may, we may have a tendency to forget really the need for a more dispassionate and detailed academic uh, analysis of important subjects. And that is certainly something that our universities afford us. Um, a few things, and few things matter really more to the viability of any polity than the health of its democracy. Of course, any dem democratic model is and should be subject to ongoing contestation and scrutiny. What is particularly interesting for us here at the European Parliament is how the instructive examination of national cases can be for the equally constant debate on EU, on the EU level democracy and the structures um, that underpin it separately and together, how that uh, would affect. So we are very delighted to host this distinguished uh, panel of experts this evening and we trust that your effort of the audience here to join uh, this event be will be rewarded, what we think will be an excellent and detailed analysis. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Sarah, and um, I'm sure <coughs> that we will then look forward also to your comments and questions. And uh, afterwards, after the event, our office is delighted to host a little reception for all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, so indeed, I'm uh, Dr. Sarah Wolf, I'm the director of the Center for European Research. Uh, we are based at uh, the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary, University of London. Uh, we are very grateful to the European Parliament Liaison Office for hosting us tonight. Uh, I would like to stress uh, indeed that we have several uh, uh, funders as well for, for tonight. We have. Uh, received some support from the French Embassy in London and the Fonds d'Alembert, uh, which has uh, enabled us to uh, to have Pauline Schnapper with us uh, tonight, our keynote speaker. Uh, of course, the the overall um, um, project within which this session is taking place is the next EUK project that you mentioned. It's a research project uh, funded and supported by uh, the Erasmus Plus program of the European Commission. It is on the future of the EU-UK relations uh, and it will drive our research agenda at the Centre for European Research at Queen Mary for the next three years. So we have three areas of concerns that we are looking at. 
um, with a, a, a team of colleagues amongst which a uh, team uh, is one of them, but I have many others who are present also uh, tonight in the room. And the first idea is actually to look at um, what has worked in the EU-UK relationship so far. Uh, so more the historical perspective, if you want. The second point is to look at why Brexit happened, uh, what are the consequences. Of course, as uh, Pauline will outline tonight, what happens in, in the UK is not necessarily an exception, and it has also some other, we can draw par parallels with what happens in <coughs> other European democracies. And thirdly, we're looking at the future, what will happen next in different sectors, trade, migration, uh, security, social policy, uh, and, and I'm leading that team uh, at Queen Mary. Um, so we hope also to, have to offer a structured space for uh, discussion between different audiences, uh, stakeholders, uh, general public, students, young people will have different kind of activities, policy makers, uh, and of course uh, also draw from uh, the research um, on this topic. So this whole uh, seminar started actually when I came across the book of Pauline Schnapper. Um, I'm sorry, it's in French only. I don't know if an English translation is planned at the moment. Okay. Uh, where is um, the United Kingdom going? Could be translated this way. Uh, Brexit and, af and, and afterwards, or what's next after Brexit, right? Um, and uh, she co-authored uh, <coughs> this book with Emmanuel Avril. Uh, Pauline Schnapper is an eminent and renowned expert of British politics based at uh, Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris 3. Uh, she's a member of the uh, Institut uh, um, Universitaire de France. Used to. Used to. <coughs> oh, okay. Um, and um, now uh, also involved uh, in, as a vice president of the University uh, of Sorbonne. Uh, and uh, when I started to think about what could be the topic of tonight, I realized that when I approached other colleagues, they all told me, oh yeah, it's such a great, great expert, and we all know Pauline, and we all want to come and, and, and share no the pressure. conversation <laughs> with her tonight, so no, I was no very pleased about pressure. this. <laughs> <laughs> there was a unanimous uh, consensus. Uh, and I really liked her book, although it's uh, written in French, because she's able also to take a step back and to draw the bigger picture of what's happening with Brexit, uh, that it is, again, not necessarily an exception uh, happening in UK politics, but it has broader implications for European democracies, liberal democracies, I would say, uh, more broadly. Um, and I've asked, uh, therefore, uh, uh, other colleagues uh, to step in. Um, two eminent colleagues, uh, I have uh, Tim Bell, he's, uh, uh, co-director of the Myland Institute at Queen Mary University of London and also deputy director of UK No Changing Europe um, and uh, I would say he's the most authoritar authoritative <coughs> reference when it comes to the Tories and the Conservative Party in British politics so I think he will respond a little bit to uh, Pauline's comments uh, from uh, a British politics uh, perspective and then uh, I'm really glad that Helen Drake uh, has stepped in at the last minute um, because this whole panel has been uh, not only uh, in trouble due to Brexit and the, the timing and the agenda of the election but also due to the French national strike. So <laughs> well, I'm really glad that Helen uh, is here. She's an eminent also uh, expert on uh, French, actually, and, and, British, and European politics, I would say, uh, director of the Institute for Diplomacy and International Governance at, at Loughborough University in London, um, and you have a chair in French and European <coughs> Studies. Um, and uh, I think you immediately said, yes, uh, no <laughs> problem, uh, I will step in, I know Pauline very well, uh, and you will also uh, discuss it from the perspective of your recent research um, <coughs> with young people. Uh, and Brexit. Um, so I think I will stop here and I will uh, leave the floor to Pauline. Um, I hope that you can all hear again. I'm sorry about this technical issue, um, but you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have a very bad cold and hoarse voice, so I hope you can uh, listen to me. Uh, I first want to thank Sarah for this invitation, 
uh, and Queen Mary uh, in general, as well as the French Embassy for, for this invitation. And thank Tim and Helen for agreeing to come. Uh, I feel a bit awkward talking about British politics in front of Tim, to be honest, and then presenting a French book, even worse, on British politics. Thank you very much. So uh, this is this is the book. As as uh, uh, Sarah was saying, the idea was to try to explain to the French public what happened here. Uh, the French public was a bit puzzled by the uh, Brexit uh, referendum result, <laughs> and uh, the idea was to try to, as you said, to step back a little bit uh, and understand not just who voted for what and why immediately, but to try to uh, look at long-term factors that it could explain um, and evolutions in the British political system that could explain uh, this, this vote. So basically what we were trying to show was that, and that I said would be the main arguments of, of the book, was on the, the one hand that the, uh, the referendum exposed as well as exacerbated some long-term weaknesses in the British political system, or at least issues in the pol British political system, that it's made worse, if I may <laughs> say. But also what we were, uh, and one of the questions which we uh, uh, saw earlier in, in a different setting was, uh, of course, to look at whether these long-term <laughs> trends were actually not long-term and simply uh, due to the specific circumstances of the last few years or whether the changes that we are witnessing at the moment uh, will be long-term. Uh, and obviously I have no answer to this. Um, also, I wanted to, to raise, we wanted to raise uh, a paradox which is that in many ways Britain has become more like continental Europe as far as its political system is concerned. Uh, and not just because it's had a coalition uh, in the last, uh, it had a coalition uh, a few years ago, uh, but also in the, uh, in the way that the, the, the party system uh, has evolved, in the way that voters have evolved, um, it's much more like what we have on the continent than before. And it's, of course, a paradox that it's, this is happening just as at a time when Britain wants to leave us. Um, so th these are the two points that I uh, would like to uh, look at. So um, there are a few long-term trends which I think are really necessary to understand uh, the, the, the referendum result. Uh, the first one is the issue of trust, which uh, the more I think of it, the more I think is really central. Uh, the decline in trust in political institutions as well as actors of the political system um, is something that we are now very familiar with. Uh, traditionally here in the UK, we make it go back to the Sleaze episode, remember? The major years. Um, Sleaze uh, at that time was shown to be really one event which led to a sharp decline uh, in trust. And th so this is one of the many very useful uh, tables that you find in the Hands Out Society's audit of political engagement, which show how low uh, uh, voters, uh, how uh, what the low esteem, sorry, that voters have now for political actors, uh, in general, uh, MPs, the government, uh, the House of Lords and political uh, political parties. So this is seen as having started with Sleaze, as having continued with the Iraq War, uh, and and Blair's lies about Iraq uh, were shown to have led to a decline in trust, and more uh, recently the expenses scandal of 2009 uh, is often referred to as one major explanation for this decline in trust. Uh, so trust uh, towards parties, but also parliament as an institution. And that in many ways is even 
uh, more problematic than when it's lack of trust for people, when it's for institutions. And presumably uh, the, the last three years and the uh, Brexit saga in Parliament probably hasn't helped. And yet, and this is something that I would very quickly want to show you, this is not just in the UK. Uh, and I'm, uh, So this is another um, uh, uh, interesting uh, table about this time not specific institutions but the political system as a whole do you think that it works well or that it uh, should be improved a little bit or uh, could be improved quite a lot or needs a great deal of improvement so this is the darker uh, uh, black that you see here and you see the evolution since 2006 when this first uh, audit of political engagement was, was made and you uh, see that the, the, the negatives on, on, on the uh, uh, bottom are clearly much uh, bigger than the positives on, on the... Um. But this is what France looks like. France, which did not have, I was going to say, did not have the Iraq war. Well, you see what I mean. Uh, did not have the scandal around the, the Iraq war, which did not have uh, the MPs uh, scandal, and yet uh, levels of trust uh, are, have also gone down quite dramatically. See, so here you have, uh, from uh, top to bottom, you have local authorities here, mayor, uh, regional councils, uh, president, prime minister, your MP, not MPs in general, but your MP, and MEPs. And unsurprisingly, you see that levels of trust are much higher for local authorities, the people you know, except for your MP, which <laughs> is very uh, low. And the more, the, 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 the further away from you you go, and the lower the level of trust is. But, so the, 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 this uh, goes uh, from 2009 to 2017, and what you see is that, well, ups and downs, on the whole, <laughs> but also uh, l low levels here between 25% for MEPs. So you know there is Euroscepticism in France as well. Um, as far as national politicians are concerned, it's between 35 and 40%, and only your local mayor gets above 50% of trust. So this is not a British phenomenon, or not just a British phenomenon, it's, it's widespread. Another, uh, um, uh, a second point which I uh, want to make, which has to do uh, as well with um, uh, the British political system, is of course the fact that the electorate has become much more volatile than it used to be. People change parties from one election to the other, but this is something that you, you know well. And the fact, what's maybe more uh, strange or unexpected in a British political system based on uh, two parties, is the rise of, of new parties since the 1970s and 80s, but that's also something that you know uh, well. Uh, what uh, the audit of political engagement uh, has shown uh, as well is, that it is the volatility that you, you see here. Uh, the red line is the line of voters who strongly uh, support one party, or not so strongly. Uh, um, uh, sorry, the green line at the bottom is the uh, strong supporter of a party, whereas the red line, which is much higher, uh, with levels of, I don't, I'm not sure you can see, but levels of 65% here uh, are the, the number of voters who don't support uh, a, a a specific party <laughs> rather than another. This makes, of course, opinion polls much harder to do than before, uh, which is why we are still not completely <coughs> sure what, of what will happen on Thursday. Um, they have become much more uh, unpredictable. What, they, what we uh, also insist on, on in the book is that there are other things outside of the political system which have an impact uh, on uh, uh, voters. One is obviously uh, the recession 
which has had an impact on the, on the Brexit vote. I would say it's not so much the recession itself as the way it was handled by uh, the coalition government and the, the austerity policies which uh, were imposed uh, from 2010 onwards which have been shown to have had an impact, but again, that's something you're very familiar with, on the, on the Brexit vote, uh, the famous you know, left behind areas and uh, demographic uh, groups, uh, which tended to vote leave more than remain, although this always needs to be qualified. Uh, so we have a whole chapter on, on this aspect, which I think the Again, you're very familiar with, but the French public was not necessarily. So this was uh, very much aimed uh, at a French audience. The second thing which we found was important in the uh, vote leave, uh, leave vote rather, was the, the degree of centralization in this country and the opposition towards London that was revealed and uh, I'm not saying it didn't ex exist before, but that was really revealed in, in the um, uh, referendum. Uh, the extent to which people outside London and the South East in general uh, felt neglected uh, and badly represented uh, by London and London in general, of course, including uh, uh, political institutions, but not just political institutions. And the, the fact that the, the degree of centralization, which even devolution hasn't really solved, and devolution within England, of course, is, is hardly existent. Um, and this, I think, is something that uh, no government has really addressed, either before or, or since uh, 2016. Um, I'm not going to uh, develop, of course, the, the question of the media, and especially social media, in contributing to this uh, uh, decline in trust. Uh, this is something that media specialists have uh, been talking about a lot, and uh, I'm not one of those. Uh, my co-author is much more so. Uh, if she was here, she could say, say more about this. But I think there's, there's a real uh, question here about the, and especially the, the ambiguities of transparency. Uh, the, more trans the more transparent the system is, uh, the, 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 the less people trust it, apparently, uh, which, again, is not something that is just is, is only in the UK, but we see elsewhere as well. Uh, the idea that democracy should be as transparent as possible is, is great, but in practice, it leads to an undermining of trust in institutions, apparently. So there's a bit of a, of a, of a problem here, which I'm not going to um, develop. So all of this, of course, we are pre-existed uh, uh, the, 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 the referendum. But of course, the referendum has made them worse, I, I would argue. First, because we are now much more aware of, but still haven't done anything about, uh, the regional as well as demographical divides that the uh, Brexit referendum has shown. Um, so London versus the rest. Uh, big cities versus sm small towns and countryside, England versus Scotland and Northern Ireland, of course, uh, and, all, and the age divide that we suspected, but which has been really, which has become very strong, which was in the remain and leave vote, but which apparently is, is now also in, uh, reflected in parties. Uh, can the, the young vote Labour by an even larger majority, it seems. We'll see after Thursday, of course, if that remains true. Uh, and, and the older people vote Conservative by an even larger margin, apparently, than before. So that, that's uh, an interesting development, I, I think. Uh, the, the second aspect, well known as well, is the fact that identity has become, if not more important than traditional right-left cleavages as well, at least has superimposed uh, on the traditional cleavages. So we now have a, a population which is divided not, not just between left and right, but maybe even more so between remain and leave, um, and on issues such as social liberalism, uh, multiculturalism, 
uh, versus authoritarianism, etc. So how does that play out and how particularly, how do parties manage to um, offer something to voters on these two diff very different uh, lines, left, right on the one hand, I uh, identity on the other, is, is very uh, difficult. What the what the um, the referendum one way one other way in which the referendum has made things much more difficult for political parties is the fact that we still don't know what voters really voted for when they voted to leave. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, the different episodes of the last three and a half years, but in many respects, uh, the, the problems in <coughs> Parliament, in political parties, and in government. Uh, were linked to the fact that voters voted to leave, but they never said how they wanted to leave, what they wanted afterwards, uh, because they were not asked, maybe because they didn't know themselves. And therefore, there's this whole range of interpretations of what the leave vote meant, uh, which has uh, led to the situation we're in at the moment. Everything I'm saying might be completely wrong within three days. I mean, uh, by Friday, uh, most of what I'm saying might, might be contradicted, so I'm taking advantage of and I'm speaking today. Um, but certainly, so far at least, it's been difficult for mainstream parties to represent the, 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 these different divides and, and these different opinions about uh, what Brexit uh, means. This, of course, has made uh, has been worse because of the the level of toxicity in the um, uh, political debate that we have experienced, that you have experienced. We we have it too, but it's not as bad as here. And again, uh, that existed before Brexit, uh, but that the Brexit vote, but that's it's been uh, made worse. Uh, uh, we we argue. Uh, by what's happened and by what everything I was uh, talking about uh, earlier. Um, again, it's difficult to say whether it's a short-term phenomenon and whether after this coming election things will sort of quieten down, but I have, well, I'm doubtful. Um, I suspect, and also because of social media, that this might get worse before it gets better. Um, in, in, in this country, but hopefully um, I'll be wrong. Then, of course, uh, the last three and a half years have also exacerbated a, uh, a more general debate about the constitutional, the, the British constitution, or at least among people like us who are interested in those issues, because I'm, I'm not sure all voters are really interested in the constitutional uh, consequences of, of the Brexit vote, but one of the things which have been striking, suddenly seen from the outside, uh, was the, the level of, of opposition between Parliament and government, uh, which is not something that, well, of course, it's it's happened before uh, in, in British political history, but at that sort of permanent level, government never agreeing with the House of Commons, uh, it becomes, I think, a real uh, problem. Then, of course, and I'll go back to the previous slide, the, 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 the opposition between the government and the Supreme Court uh, several times in the last three and a half years also raised new questions about how uh, the, system, uh, the system works. Yeah. And the last aspect of this opposition, which populist politicians of all kinds have played on, is the opposition between the people and parliament which I think is even more dangerous maybe than the, the, op uh, the, the previous uh, opposition um, because this really undermine, uh, undermines, again, trust uh, towards uh, institutions in, in general. Uh, what we've seen as we do at different intervals is the, the, the re-emergence of the debate about a written constitution which sort of comes and goes. Um, what, I'm, what I've been uh, struck by is the fact that there is so little debate about first-past-the-post. Um, again, seen from the outside, the last three and a half years seem to be a perfect illustration of, of why your constitution is great, except for first-past-the-post. 
which is really difficult to uh, adjust to a system which is in such flux. Um, and the f and it, of course, especially true when you have the two mainstream parties shifting one to the right and the other to <coughs> the left. It's very interesting to see that a center party cannot <laughs> emerge. And no one seems to find it abnormal uh, that a centrist party cannot take advantage of the radical, the populist shift of the conservative party or the radical left uh, shift of, of the, the Labour Party. And that, of course, has a, a lot to do with, um, with the electoral system. Um, so I find it interesting that there's a debate about written constitution, sort of, but not really a debate about reforming uh, uh, the electoral system, although, of course, I know why. I mean, the, the, the failure of the 2011 um, uh, referendum on electoral reform, I, I guess, explains a lot of it. But still, uh, I find it a bit uh, surprising. And I'll finish with that by uh, thanking you. And uh, just to conclude, of course, again, um, what I find interesting to, to look at and try to think about together is, is whether these are short-term changes uh, due to those very specific circumstances of the referendum three and a half years ago, or whether the referendum was only a sign of much more structural changes in the British political system. And of course, I'd be very happy to have your opinion on, on this. Thank you Thank very you much. Very much. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, while that's going on, I'd just like to thank uh, Pauline for uh, that talk. I, I should say I haven't read the book uh, yet. Um, maybe over Christmas. Uh, that will be my, my Christmas reading. Um, I'd like to start, I think, by echoing her point about the electoral system. In some ways, it is the fundamental structuring institution of this country and, it, and it's one that you know we sometimes take for granted um, and I agree that there is very little chance of it changing um, so we are in a very strange situation where we have if you like this multi-party system um, latent and sometimes uh, sometimes it very explicit as it was for example in 2010 and 2015 but that cannot if you like be born so we, we are constantly in this situation where we have this mismatch, really, between what our, our politics is fundamentally and what it is allowed to be by our institutions, and in particular the electoral system. Uh, how we solve that, I, I do not know. I suppose if we ever did get to the stage where we have uh, a debate about a written constitution, at that point we may get a debate about the electoral system uh, as part of that debate. But I, I suspect, as you say, Pauline, that the 2011 referendum, even though it wasn't actually about proportional representation, it was about what Nick Clegg called a miserable little compromise before he had to defend it in the referendum. Um, I suspect that, that that referendum has put pay to any um, kind of electoral reform. It may be if Labour loses this election, as often happens when Labour loses an election, you will get more support for proportional representation among some Labour MPs, but once again, you get into the situation where, to be honest, the two biggest parties don't see it in their interest to change the electoral system, and therefore that electoral system will not change. Um, it, it's true to say that other countries have changed their electoral systems, but um, normally those changes only occur after revolutions and wars, um, rather than um, kind of run-of-the-mill political events. Although there are lots of small changes made to electoral systems all the time, those big changes are actually fairly rare. And the only 
comparison we've got is New Zealand uh, in the early 1990s, uh, and the only reason that that changed was literally because the Prime Minister uh, misread his briefing notes on live TV and ended up promising a, a referendum that he'd never intended to promise. Um, so, you know, perhaps that might occur here, you never know, but then Boris Johnson would actually have to do a TV interview, so uh, maybe not. Um, so, uh, that's the, the, the first point I'd make. Um, the, the, uh, the next point I'd make is um, something that um, Pauline brought up early on, which is about trust in, in politics. And one of the very worrying things, I think, about this election is that it seems to me that as people um, see less and less to trust in their politicians, the politicians' response has not been to give them more to believe in, but it's given them less to believe in. There are, I think, undoubtedly more lies told by politicians in this election uh, and over the last couple of years than I have seen observing British politics for far too uh, long. It's easy for me as a, a kind of, you know, middle-aged old guy to say, oh, things were better in my day, but things were better in my day. <laughs> you, could, you could not get away with what politicians get away with now without some kind of pushback, some kind of blowback. It seems to me that the Conservative Party in particular, but the Labour Party is not much better, uh, and perhaps even the, the Sacred Lib Dem is not much better either, um, have taken a lesson from, from Donald Trump, to be honest, that it is possible to tell far more falsehoods and get away with it than anybody ever believed. Uh, and that, I think, is a very, very worrying um, aspect. And I can't see that's going to do very much for um, political trust. But as I say, I think we're now in this awful, vicious circle where the, the less people trust politicians, the more, people, the more politicians realise they can get away with lying, the less people trust politicians, and so on and so on. And I, I mean, obviously, um, <laughs> there's a limit to which trust in politicians can fall. It can't go below zero, presumably, but we are a very parlous state, I think, in, in, uh, in that respect. Um, the other interesting thing about uh, Pauline's presentation was, that, was the point about um, identity uh, politics, to some extent, not replacing our kind of traditional class or left-right alignments. I mean, that is a, a very fundamental shift in British politics, but it's a shift uh, all over Europe, um, to be honest. That um, cultural dimension, some political scientists call it um, uh, liberal authoritarian, some people call it Galtan, which is um, green alternative libertarian versus traditionalist authoritarian nationalist. Okay, but that, that other dimension, so you have the left right there and then the, the orthogonal dimension there. Um, the, the increasing importance of that cultural dimension to the way that people make up their minds uh, when they come to vote is something very, very fundamental. And it is a big shift and it is accounting, I guess, for what we seem to be seeing in the opinion polls at the moment, which is a, a move from uh, some people who traditionally would have been expected to vote Labour over to the Conservative Party because the Conservative Party is seen now to represent those culturally conservative uh, values. Uh, and, I, and I think um, obviously Brexit had something to do with that, but it's only accelerated and exacerbated a change that, as Pauline uh, identified, was uh, already there and is not unique uh, to the, the UK. Um, Having said that, however, if we're going to look at the, the Brexit referendum, and, and, and Pauline brought that up, and the reasons uh, why people voted the way they do, I think one um, possible flaw in interpretations of the, the Brexit referendum, and it's something we have to do something about going forward, is, as academics, but also journalists, and just generally people, I think, is the way we have framed it almost exclusively as the revolt of the left behind mm -hmm. uh, against the metropolitan middle class. I think that's a very dangerous framing for two reasons. One, it actually dovetails with a populist framing. Um, so it, it, in other words, it seeds grounds to the populist by, by suggesting that you can't understand that referendum unless you understand that it was the people versus mm -hmm. the elites. I'm sorry, but that doesn't wholly explain what happened in 2016 because there were an awful lot of very comfortable people in the southeast of England who were not peripheral, who were not left behind, who were sitting very comfortably in homes which they paid off 
uh, their mortgages and they were you know fine on their pensions etc etc and a lot of them voted for Brexit and one thing that we haven't really done and does need to be done by academics by journalists by all of us is is to actually reinterpret that 2016 referendum and make that reinterpretation a little bit more realistic we should try to understand why a lot of very comfortably off middle class people in the south of England voted the way they did it's probably to do with culture as much as economics but that means that economics can't explain as some people would like to explain it everything about the 2016 um, referendum uh, the other point I think that Pauline brought up uh, was about age and you uh, no doubt if you're here you already know the fact that in 2017 the best predictor of how someone would vote was their age and you may be familiar with this graph which shows the kind of cutoff was 47 so in other words people who were aged 47 and under tended to vote Labour those 48 and above um, tended to vote um, conservative. That's probably, as you say, going to be true, possibly even more so um, at uh, this election. In as much as there was a youth quake last time, the research suggests that the young people did not actually vote in greater numbers last time around, but they did vote um, disproportionately um, for the Labour Party, even more so than has been the case in the past. Now, this has interesting long-term implications because it could be that we get a, either a cohort effect here, which means that as those young people get older, they will be less and less inclined to vote for the Conservative Party, which means it's, that's a problem for the Conservative Party. If it's a cohort effect, they're in trouble, okay? Because uh, those people, as they get older, will, will retain their kind of liberal... Uh, values and either vote for the Liberal Democrats, the Labour Party or whichever party might happen to replace uh, those parties in the future, who knows. Um, the Conservatives, I expect, are going to have to um, assume and hope that it's not a cohort effect, that it's a life cycle effect. That in fact what will happen is that as these people get older, they will begin to vote Conservative. And we know actually there is some uh, evidence to suggest that as people get older, as we conventionally assume, they do tend to get a little bit more conservative, both in their cultural values and in terms of what they have to protect economically, and therefore may vote for the Conservative Party. What we'll probably see is a mix of the two. We'll see a cohort effect and uh, a life cycle effect. The Conservatives will obviously have to hope that the, the latter is, is more pronounced than the former, Labour, uh, vice versa. Um, and then, I guess... Finally, there's this point about populism. I've already touched on it. Um, I think that is you know, a, a crucial um, development in this country, but it's not, again, as Pauline stresses, exclusive to this country. We are seeing increasingly populist politics in many European countries, uh, and of course in the United States of America. And by populist, I simply mean the tendency uh, of people to frame um, social and political conflict uh, as between a, a, a sort of virtuous people, if you like, and a, and a corrupt elite. Um, it's a very, very strong uh, politically uh, useful frame, and it's one that clearly uh, politicians on both left and right are, are willing to believe uh, and are willing to use, uh, more so generally speaking on the right, but it, not exclusively um, so. There's a, a, a really brilliant but very worrying book and I'm going to get the author's names the wrong way around here um, by uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt okay Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt called How Democracies Die uh, and they set out there uh, I think it's three or four conditions um, to look out for uh, to, to give a sense of how healthy your democracy is and if you go through those conditions I'm not going to go into them in, in detail now Actually, what you've seen from this government in terms of, for example, you know, questioning the rule of law, <coughs> suggesting that your enemies are some, your opponents are somehow enemies beyond the pale, um, threatening broadcasters, and Boris Johnson today has started talking about taking away the um, uh, the BBC's license fee, for example. All those things that they identify as indicators of democracy dying, and democracies do die. We get used to the fact that they're not going to. 
um, are present in, in the UK uh, right at the moment. So on that cheerful note, uh, I will finish and hand over, I think, to Helen. Yes. Thanks. Can you, can you hear all right? Yeah. Um, first point is, as Sarah said, in my defence, so Sarah said I did come in quite late, and I mentioned that because Catherine Fieschi, who would have been here, she has written a very interesting book called Populocracy, Popul it's hard to pronounce, Populocracy, which I think is well worth a read. It does sort of, I think, echo some of the points you made right just there at the end. So a very interesting book on, on populism. Um, so I do recommend that. Uh, just very briefly, just uh, a couple of things directly in response. So I noticed on Pauline's presentation on the graph showing trust in French institutions, I don't know if you noticed, but the only graph that was rising was that of the actual, the current president. Mm -hmm. So I hope that President Macron is taking some sort of comfort uh, from the fact that his is the only rising curve on a day when France is pretty much shut down, but you're here. Um, so that, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, you talked about the cleavages, um, and it just struck me while you were talking, and again, uh, listening to Tim as well, that uh, it seems old hat, doesn't it, but one of the cleavages that we've become accustomed to here in the UK, especially UK, British-based, British university-based academics, is a cleavage between experts and non-experts. Um, and you mentioned that it's probably only people like us who are talking about the constitution or, or, or voting reform. And I think you've got a, that's an, in, that's an important point because at what level are people engaging with conversations about Brexit? I, don't, I really think you're right. I really don't think necessarily that Christmas dinner tables are going, I try with the students to say, take this back at Christmas. But I don't really think that those are the things necessarily that are going to be under discussion. Um, and, I, and on that question of expertise, I've had it said to me, um, full disclosure, in the context of a failed grant application, you know, the, the comment came back and said, well, you say that um, there's been a problem around expertise in the matter of Brexit, but, but the critic said, uh, we've had so much expertise, so much information. There's like, everyone knows about trade. Everyone knows. It's true that the level of information and expertise circulating, I think, in the last three and a half years since Brexit, um, of course, yes, in the, in the media, in all sorts of media, on social media, it's true. It, it's, 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 it's encouraging and, and, and it's large. But, but I suppose the, a question we might like to ask ourselves is, but how does that expertise, does that expertise, how does it enter into any form of um, learning <coughs> on the part of those who are making the decisions around Brexit? Despite what the Tories say, get Brexit done, it's, we all know it's not going to be done. So this is an ongoing process. So I'm, I'm talking here about Brexit really as, as process. And to what extent are we as so-called experts and, 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 and so on, how are we actually are we informing in any shape or form um, the, the genuine sort of uh, behavior and, and to what extent can we expect or hope to influence what you were talking about, Tim, about cultural attitudes and so on. And saying that, um, on that basis, I think you invited me quite kindly to, to talk about some research that I have just conducted. One of my co-investigators is in the room, Nicola, uh, and Tim was there later, so um, in, my, in, my, in my day job, as, as it were. And we've been running two projects just concluded, really looking at stakeholders, so people who feel that they have a stake in Brexit, both here in the UK, but not just in the UK, also in the EU27 and in Brussels itself. <coughs> um, and it sort of struck us, um, or it struck me sort of subsequently, that in a way that the Brexit process, if we can call it that, the actual negotiations, whether it was in the first stage or what presumably will become the second, the third, the fourth stages, it's not that they're hermetically sealed, um, that they're, they're not at all, but um, we, we sort of, we, it struck us that Brexit is perhaps a unique, um, uh, it's a unique example of a, mul of a of multi-stakeholder negotiations, or to put it another way, it, perhaps compared to, I might be wrong, but perhaps compared to other <coughs> trade negotiations, see, th there's a feeling that private citizens, uh, young people on the cusp of voting, not able to vote yet, feel that they have a stake. And, and, and really, 
the, the negotiations, as I say themselves, particularly in the UK party to the negotiations, partly because it's been unplanned slash chaotic, it hasn't really allowed in a rigorous, systematic way, we argue, <coughs> for the inclusion of those multiple stakes. Um, and so, just to sort of very briefly, maybe come just uh, highlight one or two findings from the research. Um, one is to do with negotiations, and I worked with a colleague in international business um, and international relations, and we worked with someone who we didn't really understand. He does data analytics um, and sentiment analysis. So it was true, genuine, interdisciplinary research, um, which I very much enjoyed. And, and, and our combined research, so combining data analytics, social media, and sentiment analysis, um, it demonstrated how valuable it could be were negotiators, in this case in Brexit, to have maybe listened to that sort of drumbeat of social media, and then we looked at Twitter. I mean, please don't quiz me on the methodology because I just won't answer. Um, uh, I'll, I'll refer you to my colleague. But there are all sorts of methodological <coughs> issues around counting tweets or analyzing. I, I, I totally accept that, but those can be uh, those can be mitigated for, and it just we so that that particular project demonstrated that if in the first phase, the very first phase of Brexit negotiations, had the UK government somehow had its ear to the ground, um, there was evidence, be that as you know, with that, with all caveats, to suggest that sentiment, emotion around Brexit outcomes, kind of were most positively aggregated around a soft Brexit. The most negative sentiment was associated with um, a, a no deal and a hard Brexit, and yet here we are. Uh, so take that as it may, but that was one, one sort of work package, if you like. Um, moving slightly differently, so that's really talking um, about individual private citizens. And we did try to screen out trolls, and that's part of the problem with the methodology, but let's say that uh, that tells us something about public opinion. And so in the Brexit case, the point being is that really the UK government didn't really, I mean, it's not used to taking into account <coughs> public opinion, let alone parliamentary opinion, at the phase of proposing uh, negotiation wind sets. Okay. Um, a second uh, finding from a different strand of the project, really, was um, where we looked at political parties as stakeholders, and, and this time shifting from the UK to the EU27. And we, our second research was that... Um, insight was that the UK <coughs> vote by referendum did not trigger a domino effect whereby other EU member states found themselves pressured to leave in the wake of the UK. And we looked, I mean it seems like <coughs> ages ago, 2017, 2018, we looked at those four countries most susceptible in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit vote to pressure from radical right Eurosceptic parties to also leave. So that was the Netherlands, Germany, France, and Italy. France actually was a bit of an outlier, um, not, not that surprising, but we did find that in none of those four countries which held national elections on the heels of the Brexit vote, and despite conventional wisdom, those parties, those radical right parties, were actually not so eager to leave. And the FN, as it was then, was a good example of a party that rode back <coughs> on its very sort of, hey, Brexit's liberated the, the, the British, let's liberate ourselves. And the reasons we found, uh, it was a snapshot really, that um, very mundane, the reasons why these parties perhaps weren't so eager to leave at that point were to do with intra-party leadership rivalry, jostling on the political spectrum uh, between parties, and also the salience or not of Europe in the public. So that was another finding. And then finally, I'll just finish... Um, so it's a little bit eclectic, sorry. But the other project that I ran uh, was going into UK schools and simulating decision-making uh, um, around the freedom of movement um, in the break. So this, the, these were 16 to 18 year olds on the cusp of voting. Most of them thought, well, why are we here? And the teacher said, we've got to be here. But they, they valiantly took up the role of Jeremy Corbyn, basically of diplomats, negotiators, lobbyists and politicians and in real time because these things were going on in real time in Brussels and so on uh, they simulated the exercise and I think it, simulation games as a pedagogical exercise are absolutely I'm not claiming any innovation here so we did that that was another project um, 
and those, those students actively experience via simulation the realities of, di of diplomacy and negotiations. And we have evaluated them. And coming soon at a journal near you, um, this, so that, 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 felt like, that felt like it was worth doing in its own sake, even though we only managed to go into about three schools in the East Midlands and three in the South East, uh, populated by the children, the sort of people you were talking about, Tim, a second ago. Um, and a final, so that was really about, we stumbled, I felt we stumbled upon a way of engaging with stakeholders, people who do have a stake in Brexit, but they don't have a voice, perhaps I can put it that way. And the final pathway, if you like, that we designed, again stumbled on, was something, I don't know if you've heard of the World Cafe, so the World Cafe is like a trademarked method for communicating and learning. And we, 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 we designed Brexit cafes on that method. And what we found, we did three here in the East Midlands. The East Midlands one attended by the local MP there, Nicky Morgan, who was quite impressed. Um, it was that when we brought together stakeholders from big business, small business, medium size, um, and other stakeholders, so the, from schools, from universities, from youth theatre groups, it was a bit eclectic. What came out of it was that they felt collectively that they had sort of co-created an awareness of themselves as stakeholders, as in, well, why didn't I have a voice? Um, and why don't I get to talk to other stakeholders? Why aren't we brought together? Um, so one of the business stakeholders, for example, said, well, actually, I'm worried about Brexit. We all talk about trade and business, but really, it makes me feel, Brexit makes me feel like a European company. Um, and so there were these sort of limited, but I thought interesting, Mechanisms. We've, we're hoping to develop these toolkits for to, to go forward. Really. So it's creating sustainable methods for stakeholders to voice their interests and share an understanding of interests that hopefully will take us into the post-Brexit era. So thank you for the invitation well, to thank you very expose much. my research. <laughs>
Second, that point was never raised. Second point I'd like to raise is shouldn't the EU look in the mirror at its own anti-democratic behaviour? The European Commission are not elected. <coughs> and that may have something to do with why people might be voted out. It is not just the House of Lords. You know, we want real democracy and we're living in a sham, both in here well, and on the continent. The European Parliament has just voted in the European Commission, so there is actually a They're process. not voted by the people. Yes, they are. Well, they there are, is they are the European Parliament, Parliament who actually... They're not directly elected by the people. Yes, they are. They're not elected by the people. Any other reaction or question in the audience? No? Yeah? Jane? There's one here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jameson. No, no. uh, no, no. okay. Agnès and yeah, then yeah. Jameson. Well, um, I'm being the devil's advocate. Can you please speak up and yes, introduce okay. yourself? My name is Agnès Eiffel, from Italy and from the Maison Française de Soir. My question is, I mean, there's a tendency to believe that the referendum led to popular discontent and that the, the way leadership elections were introduced in Britain, for example, led to populist leaders as well with Corbyn being elected by registered supporters and and obviously um, Johnson by, uh, by the party members. So opening up the system leads to populism in a way. Would you would you actually argue with both of you that returning to some form of closure would be a solution mm. to populism uh, and perhaps not addressing the question of political trust would be one of the key Solutions. Can I take your question as well? Yeah, thank you. Uh, James Trump, Mary University of London. Um, I'm interested in what the panel thinks might happen in terms of the sort of constitutional challenges that have been thrown up, demonstrated uh, by Brexit itself. Um, whether there whether we should expect an attempt to change the voting system, whether we should expect an attempt to codify the Constitution, um, whether Brexit is enough of a moment to trigger that kind of process, or are we going to carry on muddling through as we are, and if, we, if we're going to carry on muddling through, surely something else will happen at some point that will continue to expose this problem. Do you want to start? Oh, um, sorry, the team, you have to move. Oh, yes. Go on. <laughs> sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. And sneak, then you will sneak have Sneak off. I mean, uh, this question about provocation, I mean, it is, a, is an interesting one. I mean, I, I think, obviously, politicians and maybe staffers as well, if we're talking about Seamus Mill, have always been um, keen to make statements will, which will kind of catch the news uh, and, and I think social media possibly exacerbates that tendency because you know you, you've got to say something provocative to get noticed in this information uh, environment. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's 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 no sense in which I wanted to imply that you know the kind of uh, either the falsehoods or the provocative statements are on one side rather than another. I mean, they're, they're absolutely everywhere, and in some senses, that's what uh, worries me. Um, to to and yes, I mean. I think, I mean, it is a really interesting question. I know um, my colleague Rob um, Saunders at, at Queen Mary University, who teaches history, wrote a brilliant book if, you, if you're looking for Christmas presents on the 1975 <laughs> referendum. Um, uh, trust me, it is, it is really, it's a really good read. It's very funny. It's very, anyway, but um, he, he objects very strongly to this intra party democracy, um, you know, and, and, and he believes that a lot of what's wrong with our politics is that we give the choice of leader now to, uh, in Labour's case, you know, what it, whatever it was, 375,000 unrepresented people on the left, and in Boris Johnson's case, 109,000 very unrepresented people on the right um, to, to, to pick leaders. Um, I, I think, you know, he has a point, and in a way, I, I suppose as a... I, I might myself go back to having MPs who have to actually work with these people and observe them, but also have a sense of the electorate being as important as party ideology in, in some ways, uh, making the decision. But the problem is, I, I think it, it's... I don't think I can think of any example where, where the genie's been put back in a bottle. In other words, where parties have moved to becoming internally more democratic and giving their members a say on the choice of leader and then deciding all well, that didn't work 
and we're going to take it away from you. It's just it's just very difficult to imagine that how that's going to. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but it's dead. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 so it is tricky. I mean, it's I I don't see how we go back to that. In other words, members themselves are going to have to be, in some senses, more responsible, perhaps. And I mean, we may see after the election if Labour loses it, we may you know possibly see the Labour Party. Um, as some centrists would suggest, come to its senses and elect a rather more kind of credible centrist um, politician as their leader, or, or we might not. We might see them double down and go for another left winger and it'll take another election after this one before members either drift away because, you know, or, or, or decide that they've made the wrong decision. So I don't know about that. In terms of James's question, I mean, I think um, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean... Part of the reason I'm sure James asked that is because actually the Iraq war was a big event that made a big difference to the way that you know, we, we proceed constitutionally, even though it's just a convention. You know, James's work um, is on kind of war powers uh, and, and the extent to which Parliament now controls the decision or not <laughs> to go to war. Uh, and that came about as an event. So would Brexit uh, do the same? I mean, I, I, I think the aftermath of Brexit might do the same in the sense that if you look and, you know, conspiracy theorists who look at the Conservative Party manifesto and see all sorts of dark things in it, see, and I can't remember which page it is or which paragraph it is, 128 or something, see this very sort of dark veiled threat to do something about judicial oversight of politics. Now, quite how you do that um, through statute, I, I don't know. Um, I'm certain they'll try and do it that way rather than through rewriting the constitution. No. So uh, I, I doubt very much whether Brexit, certainly from the Conservative point of view, is enough to actually make a difference. And I suspect, for example, when it comes to electoral reform, and I've already touched on this, as soon as Labour eventually, possibly, um, wins another election, you know, be it five years' time, be it on Thursday, uh, be, it, be it in ten years' time, I suspect that Labour won't then do anything about the electoral system because it won under first past the post. And as we know from 1997, once Labour wins under first past the post, all its doubts about that electoral system somehow fade into insignificance. Thank you. Um, well, I agree with everything Tim just said, so well, in maybe case, I'll to, <laughs> uh, on the first, on, on the provocative statements, I, I, I see what you mean, and I think also that social media, and well, the state of the media in general play a huge part in that, unfortunately. What I would add, maybe, is that I'm not sure I would put exactly in the same category a provocative statement, which to me is an opinion, maybe a stupid opinion, but an opinion, and a lie. Mm. Lying is to say something that you know is wrong. Making a provocative statement is more like, I'm saying what I think, and others will agree or not. I don't, I don't know if, if you see what I mean. A say, when Joe Swinson says, I will, uh, we will revoke Article mm -hmm. 50 without a referendum, it's foolish, but it's not a lie. It's provocative. Well, it's provocative. It's <coughs> politically foolish, I think. It's essential. But it's not exactly the same as saying something that you know is wrong. I don't know if you see what I mean. Uh, I'm not saying it's, it's better or worse. It's, but to me, it's, it's, a, it's a different category. Um, on leaders' election, I think also that it's probably too late, mm. uh, and I also feel that the populist genie is, is wider mm. than that, unfortunately, so I'm not sure it would help, but certainly it was part of a wider phenomenon of, of, of uh, the spread of populism in, in British politics, and I think it didn't help, for sure, mm. but whether we can go back now, again, like Tim, um, I don't know. Um, I don't think you will codify your constitution. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but there seems to be this attachment to the flexibility of an uncodified constitution, which, after all, you might argue has worked. I mean, we have a, a, a French 
colleague, an expert in, in the British Constitution, uh, uh, which win, <laughs> and yes, uh, 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 who thinks that the, the Constitution has been very resilient, and that after all, when Johnson tried to prorogue Parliament, he was stopped. The Constitution worked. Uh, and that um, in many, and, and that also he's, he argues that the Constitution cannot correct the faults of politicians and that you know, even in a very codified constitution like the French Fifth Republic Constitution, you have politicians trampling on it. It's not enough to have a, a codified constitution to ensure that nothing like what you've experienced in the last few months or years can happen again. And I, I'm, so again, I'm not an expert, but I think it's an interesting argument. Uh, but somehow, I think it's this kind of debate that you've been having for the last 30 years, once in a while, and it never comes to anything. So I'd be surprised if this time was different. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> I think in response to the, the, the comments that you, the, the first questioner made, one thing that pop came into my head was about how um, you know, the, the the referendum forced us all into those of us who voted into a, into a binary choice, and I think you'll find that it is possible to be uh, a Eurosceptic in the genuine sense of the term, perhaps, which is sceptical, as in asking questions, and vote remain. So, to it is possible to be critical of the European Union, and also to decide that at this point in time, in this in this period of the 21st century, it might be more circumspect to vote for the status quo than not. Um, having said that, some of the interesting work that I'm seeing emerge, both from within my, my colleagues, I think he's left him, Oliver, is, is actually looking, but more from the point of the negotiations, what, did, what could the EU learn, both collectively and its member states, from the way that the negotiations have gone? You know, was it perhaps, but all these things are with hindsight, aren't they? You know, to what extent will we subsequently perhaps think, or, or, or the, the Commission for that matter, that to have gone into its sort of routinized bureau, bureaucratic approach to negotiations on behalf of the member states, was that right in, in an unprecedented case of a, dealing with a soon-to-be former member state? Um, but there's good reasons why it has conducted itself as it has. But I, I wouldn't want you to think that there's no form of critique or uh, analytical, uh, yeah, um, analysis. Sorry, analysis of the, the the EU side as well as the UK side, specifically around the negotiations. So that 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 popped into my head. Um, and another thing that came in uh, was. So Simon Cooper, K-U-P-E-R, who writes for the FT Weekend magazine, says something recently, he's quite professional <coughs> too, but he said he wrote something recently which really <coughs> stuck with me, and I say this as a British citizen, so I, I can criticise myself. Um, he said, quote, well, virtually word for word, the British, he said, have learned to be un... un sorry, the British have learned to be unserious about politics. And I really feel that uh, in my... Uh, dotage now, <laughs> but, and having taught European studies or French or politics for, for, for decades, I do sort of feel, maybe compared to France, which is what I really like talking about actually, um, that I think Simon Cooper had, had, had put his finger on something which resonated with me, that as a nation, as a polity, there's an extent to which, part, but, uh, Tim's not here, but um, you know, Tim mentioned that democracies do die and I feel quite strongly that the fact that you know British British democracy is stable and so on, but it might not always be like that. So um, I would like us to become serious about politics as a nation. Which sort of goes to your point, James, which is who would be who, what, how would be the agent of change. So I'd be quite interested to know. Perhaps I'll go and read your work on on um, the Iraq War and so on to, to know how those changes came about and and what the vehicle was. I just don't see, I think I agree with Pauline, I, I, we don't seem to be, we seem to be in quite an amateurish phase at the moment where anything goes and anything's said and, and how we would get to a, it almost strikes me that we need a, sort of a, a slightly refreshed democracy through more participation and deliberation to even address those sorts of things. Because if we're all unserious about it, um, then, and don't have a voice as such in those changes, I don't really see how we would Effect, uh, bring them into, into, into being. 
Um, I will take another round of questions. I see Françoise, Dominique, and then the lady over there, and this gentleman, Françoise. Françoise Borchard, Queen Mary University. Um, yes, an issue that was very much talked about during the campaign, the referendum campaign, which I think to some extent perhaps goes towards explaining <coughs> the shift from partisanship to more identity politics <coughs> is the migration issue. Of course, it came right after the crisis of migration of the summer of 2015. But um, I just want to raise that uh, with the panel, to what extent is that actually part of the, uh, the explanation that we, for the last three and a half years, nobody's <coughs> talked about migration anymore. And now, you know, it's <coughs> Uh, and yet, it, it seemed to have motivated a lot of uh, people to move to vote for me. I know in the county that I come from, and uh, in the <coughs> city of Essex, it was very much part of the motivation yeah. for voting me. In, in Pauline's book, you have a full chapter on the <laughs> migration uh, explanation, so I would really encourage you. Um, uh, Dominic? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, at various points in the 20th century, 21st century, you've seen one or other party come under real ideological internal strain. But it's very, very unusual to see two or more parties come under that strain. If you were to speculate, do you think that the, the current configuration, the current party configuration in this country can be sustained? Thank you. Yes. Right-wing populists are more successful than left-wing populists. Thank you. Very good question. <laughs> uh, I had the gentleman. Yes. Yes, Christopher Marshall. Um, we've had the biggest ever democratic exercise in this country, and it was ignored. So what is next for British democracy? Um, I think the, the answer is ignore it. Okay. Thank you. I think. Shall we? No, I, <laughs> I was going to reverse order, but I think indeed there are lots of questions for Podine as um, well. Immigration, yes, that was clearly a, a major factor in, in the Leave vote. Uh, the areas which voted most to leave were not necessarily areas where you had uh, the highest number of migrants, mm -hmm. but often areas where you had, had a recent wave of migration. Uh, the coastal areas in the, in the east of England, for example, had seen uh, the arrival of East Europeans working in the fields. Um, whereas London, which has a long tradition of multicultural uh, arrivals of all kinds, voted, as you know, uh, to remain. So, so that, that was uh, a, a very interesting factor. And, and the Leave campaign was extremely successful in using the 2015 migrant crisis in its campaign, which came only a few, uh, a few months later. You all remember the breaking point poster uh, in front of which uh, Nigel Farage stood just a few days before the referendum, showing lines of, of migrants across uh, uh, Europe as if they were about to come into the UK. I'll just remind, uh, remind you that very few, if any, of those uh, migrants ever reached these shores, um, unlike... Uh, and also taking back control. Right? And the whole, the, the, the whole rhetoric of, of absolutely, the, the, the whole rhetoric of yeah. taking back control included, of course, taking back control of the borders. And, and Johnson is, is using it again uh, in, in this campaign. I mean, in the, de the debate with Corbyn the other day, he kept referring to the control of of borders and of migration as, as a reason to vote conservative. Um, so I, I suspect that re remains important, although as you said as well, opinion polls since then, since the, the, the referendum vote, have shown that immigration is no longer on top of the uh, voters' priorities, which is interesting, as if once they had vented <coughs> uh, their, their disagreement and got the result that they got the, the, the leave result, uh, that was enough to satisfy them. So th that's interesting here. Um, and I don't know how, how this will play out uh, in, in the future, but it's, uh, it was very important in 2016, that's for sure. Uh, the second question was about uh, party 
reconfiguration. I'm sorry, I forgot. Yes. The two party system. The two party system. Well, uh, I think we have, in a way, answered the question with, uh, that question with the, the, the whole issue of the electoral system. I think right. as long as the, elect the first past the polls remains, I don't see how a multiple party system can emerge. Uh, well, it has emerged in terms of you have all these parties existing, but but they 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 are not represented in, in part. I mean, the difference between the the, the uh, results of the last European elections and what we'll get probably at the end of this week will be very interesting. Uh, we almost had a four-party system in May, yeah. with four parties around 20% of the votes because you have proportional representation. Well, it's not the only reason. It's also that no one cares in this country about European uh, Parliament elections. Um, but, and, and, and probably by the end of this week, we'll be back to a two-party system with the Conservative and Labour parties sharing 80 or 85% of the seats. So as long as we have this, you have this, I keep saying we, uh, <laughs> you have this electoral system, uh, it's. I don't see how it can really uh, change. Why are right-wing populists more successful than left-wing populists? I really don't have an answer to that. Maybe... Well, we have a colleague working on that, no? So <laughs> Stein. <laughs> I'm sure Stein would have a better answer. Any, any, any quick reply or...? <laughs> Sorry. Well, no pressure. Well, this because they mobilize on the issues that are that are very, very salient, that are made salient, partly due to what the media writes about, them, but, but they mobilize on, on the basis of cultural issues, and what you're mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe so, you can continue the conversation, yeah, okay. also yeah. over drinks. <laughs> yeah. We'll have drinks. Um, and there was a last yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, about yeah. the referendum mm -hmm. um, and democracy. I can try, just on that, and but, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Staying, go to, yes, huh? off for over drinks, but um, I think there's an issue around the populism, around simplicity and complexity, uh, and there's a, a, simplifi a, a simplification, perhaps, um, in some of the messaging uh, that we associate with the, the right. Um, and so if we take an example of a, a left-wing populism, which perhaps is trying to make more complex arguments around e economics and and trade models and business, perhaps that, perhaps, perhaps it's something to do with comple complexity versus simplification too, but he's your man. Um, <laughs> uh, and also I'd be interested, to, we don't have time now, but I'd be interested to know a little bit more about your question as well, uh, you know, the context of that question. Was the last point about democracy being ignored? Yes, because we had the, the biggest democratic exercise that this country has ever had. Okay. Yeah. And you would have thought that in that case something might actually happen. So I suppose my immediate response is that I, I wouldn't frame, I take your point, here we are, um, three and a half years later, I, I, I wouldn't frame the what's happened or not happened as having been ignored. On the contrary, um, there's been a lot of ac action and activity. I, I think what we have seen is a referendum, a binary referendum, jarring with parliamentary politics, jarring with the left-right divide, um, cleavages, as Pauline was talking about earlier. It's almost, <laughs> if I wanted to be really sort of crass about it, it's kind of, that's nobody's fault in a, way, in a way, although we could find fault, but the referendum, the process of referendum, the way, the, the nature of the question has come up against other, um, other, other formats, other, other forms of expression, including parliamentary sovereignty. We have also seen um, leadership, political leadership, uh, at the level of the British executive, the government, being stretched to the limits of its capacity. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not mentioning anybody in particular here, but I, it's not just, uh, I'm not just talking about 1pm. So I'm trying to be sort of make what I see as factual observations about um, uh, elements of the political system that have found themselves under strain, be it Theresa May or, 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 or Boris Johnson. There has also been, and that was one of the points I raised earlier, a rather perhaps um, overly traditional, simplistic approach to the negotiations, partly because the, the result wasn't foreseen, on the UK side, but also on the EU side. Almost business as usual is how we do negotiations, but actually it hasn't worked because, because of what I was mentioning earlier about the multiplicity and diversity of stakeholders. So um, 
you're right in saying that it feels like nothing's happened, but that that is to overlook what has been done and, and what has been concluded between the two parties to the negotiation. And the fact that there has been friction, shall we say, in the UK system and the UK political system can be partly explained by the fact that the referendum has sort of shaken everything up. Plus, there is evidence um, of the, that the referendum itself was, to an extent, a flawed exercise in democracy. There, there's a provocative statement for you, but we, you know, as in... You wouldn't say that would remain one, would you? Well, I, 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 okay, that, well, we won't know because it didn't, and so I can't really, you know, that's a counterfactual, which has a good place in, in political science and analysis. That's a fair point, but we can't, I can't answer that because we don't know. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm say, I said the exercise itself was partly flawed. And I didn't, say, I didn't say the result was flawed, I just said as an exercise. So for all those reasons, I, I, I'm trying to reframe it not as nothing's happened, but that lots of difficult things have happened. Uh, and not happened, and we are here for those reasons. So. No, no, I think um, we have to unfortunately uh, close the debates and uh, this evening. Please um, stay tuned. So we have started a conversation, and the take-home message I have from you, from the panel, is we need also to be self-reflective about our democracies, uh, but also about our research. Uh, you mentioned you had a very pertinent point on how we can, we can actually you know, make a difference, have an impact. We've been speaking about Brexit for so long. And what, ha what have politicians learned? How, how can we um, yeah, continue the debate and, and just be also self-reflective and, and, and draw le the lessons? So at CER and with Next EUK, we will continue that debate. Um, I would like to thank you all for your participation, especially a warm thank you to uh, our keynote, to Helen, uh, to team as well. Um, again, thank you to all our sponsors. And uh, I would like uh, especially to give uh, a thank you to the team that is behind uh, this event. So to Mina, Manisha, uh, Antonio, and all those who have helped make it, uh, make it possible. Um, thank you again to the French Embassy, European Parliament, and to the Jean Monnet Programme. And thank, thank you, you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.